Um, so welcome um, to the Audit and Assurance Committee, Tuesday the 12th of July, um, held both um, a hybrid meeting, held both uh, remotely and in person. Um, I'm presuming that everybody can see and hear us. Um, if I don't see hands, then um, just wave, wave your arms about um, if you need to, to speak, because sometimes it's difficult on the screen. So, um, so if we start, <clears throat> we haven't got any welcomes, I don't think. I think everybody's been previously. Um, so we move straight on to... <coughs> um, and Davy's got a cough. <laughs> Um, so if we move straight on to um, apologies for absence. David, Cathy, who's doing this? If Cathy could please confirm. Sorry, David. If Cathy could please confirm uh, the apologies. Yeah, we've had apologies from Penny. Thank you. Thanks. Um, do I have any declarations of interest? None received, Chair. Okay, thank you, David. Um, and um, if we move on to the minutes um, of the Audit and Assurance Committee on the 10th of June, um, going through for accuracy in the first instance, um, page one, page two, page three, four, I six and seven. Um, I can't see any hands. So is everybody happy that those are an accurate yes. representation? Thank you. Um, and if we move on to the action log from um, the 10th of June audit committee meeting. All have uh, been completed action, Chair. Uh, Completed. Thank you, David. I'm trying to minimise um, um, you having having to having to speak. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'll be fine. All right. See you. Okay. Thanks. Um, are there any matters arising from the minutes um, that anybody wants to raise that aren't on the agenda this morning? No. I can't see any hands. Okay. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, so if we move on to part two, matters for consideration, um, and has Sean, yes, I can see Sean has joined us. Welcome, Sean. Um, and we move on to the general digital update. So if I hand over to Sean. Sean, who's there? I think she's connecting her audio. All oh, right, I can see her. Oh, there's two of them. Or am I dreaming? Oh, I think she might be having connection issues. It says the audio is still connecting, yeah. Can you hear or see us, Sean? No. Jay, is that something that we can easily resolve, or should we come back to Sean? Uh, I'm looking into it now, see if anything I can do from my side to people worth coming back, I think. Okay, <clears throat> shall we move on then um, to the next item, and um, we'll in interrupt if we need to. If um, Sean can, if you let us know if Sean's connected. So, David, do you want to do the information governance and information management, or would you rather Sean was here for that? Oh, I see the point. Um, it's probably best that Sean is here for that particular paper. Okay. Um, Paul, I'm going to ask if you mind if you um, make a start on the internal audit progress report and then get um, rudely interrupted um, if, if Sean um, can connect, because I know she's got a tight schedule today. Is that all right? Of course it is. Of course, Chair. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll take the paper as read. Um, uh, but I've provided a few brief updates on the on the position that's reported in Table One of the um, of the progress report. 
Uh, and that's really just to reflect that the, the partnership piece, uh, the brief has been agreed and we shall be starting that uh, piece of work very soon. The workforce training development review is now work in progress. The performance management framework, the brief has been issued for that. Um, and then similarly on, the, on that first front page, you can see that the, the migration of system Q2 piece and the, the we've met with the Director of Defence for the uh, budgetary control piece of work, which is also scheduled for Q2, and we should be issuing the brief for that uh, later on today. Uh, generally, we're in, we're in a, a good position in terms of overall delivery. Uh, you can see that the the uh, the plan quarter review. So usually that generally means that we look like to get the to be a position where the where the auditors are on the ground doing a piece of work in the reflected uh, uh, planned quarter. So that is happening for, for workforce and training. There is a small bit of slippage in partnership working one, uh, but but you know we're, we're we're starting there imminently. And in terms of scheduling through to the to the next audit committee, as I stand, it seems like that would be absolutely fine. Uh, I wasn't intended to say uh, much more than that, but happy to take questions. Thank you, Paul. Very helpful. Um, any questions? Yeah, thank you, Jane. Uh, that's more of an observation than a, than a question, Paul. Uh, obviously, there is a lot to uh, deliver in time for the October meeting of the Audit Insurance Committee. So conscious that uh, you know, there's a very busy uh, time for, for you guys in internal audit. Um, and just, uh, just to flag up that you know, the best one in the world, sometimes you know, the, the best laid plans and all of that. Um, I think you know, maybe some early warning if, uh, if things are, are going you know, slightly behind and if, if perhaps we need to help. Uh, Jimmy things along a little bit, uh, but obviously very conscious that you know, you've got a huge amount of work ahead of you, really important work as well uh, in terms of that, that planned activity, particularly around uh, workforce training and development and, and particularly performance management frameworks I'm looking forward to seeing. Um, so I think, yeah, just if you could be sure that we're, we're kept, kept abreast as to any uh, any potential slippage, but yeah, accepting that, um, you know, you've got the best plans possible with a you know, rag status and everything else attached to it and and suddenly, yeah, something goes awry. But uh, yeah, I'm sure we'd be happy to help out if, if needed. That's that's most appreciated, Jonathan. Uh, we have we have regular meetings with um, with the board secretary. So um, you know, if there are any things that any 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 bumps along the road, then we'll we'll pick them up with him and um, and uh, try and work those through. You know, it, as I said, as it stands at the moment, we're we're absolutely looking to to deliver those forward to this uh, to the October committee. But but as you said, there's there's always that risk that you know, there could be a, a bigger bump than anticipated in the road, but we'll, we'll flag that if, if and when that happens. Yes. Thanks, Paul. And um, I think um, certainly myself and the um, other members of the audit committee really appreciate the, the detail that you've gone into there with giving us timings yeah. and things that are often bumps in the road, but really appreciate the fact that you've, you know, you've, um, you've given us much more certainty about um, about the timing and planning so thanks for that okay oh i think sean's connected <laughs> she's not for connecting to her name that must be good news <laughs> sean are you there i am i can hear you now sorry i could see you but not hear anything at all so connected now Oh, great, you, you looked as though you were connecting. So we just um, we just took an item on the agenda um, ahead of you um, and we said we would come back, but luckily Paul's brought it in just um, just at the, <laughs> at the right time. So um, in terms of internal audit, are we happy to note the progress report? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, if we go back now to item um, two one, the general digital update. So over to you, Sean. Yeah, thank you. So um, during our last meeting, we received a um, audit report in relation to the digital readiness of HRW, and that stimulated some discussion with an audit committee about the general direction and things we were had planned in um, digital. And this paper just follows on from those conversations and provides an overview of our key strategic programmes and the work that we've done. Um, it outlines um, our approach um, and our, our governance uh, to that. Um, it goes through um, the 
the way we're organized within the organization, having strategic objectives of which some are, are detailed there, and then each of the um, departmental areas having uh, delivery plans and progressing and, and tracking progress against those on a monthly and quarterly performance uh, reporting in line with the, the um, way of working within the organization. So the areas highlighted, um, and I, I won't go through it in detail, um, because people will have read the paper, but some key points to note is the implementation of our le new learning management system, um, which is ERTI Desky, and that describes the benefits of working with um, a best practice resource for online uh, learning. Um, the second one is the excellent work that's been progressed on the digital capabilities, and this is in line with the strategy, the workforce strategy, and our IMTP of supporting NHS Wales with um, a digital ready workforce and this is the first part of that program of work um, and this has been established right across Wales now with a community pr practice of over a hundred um, participants and it describes the work to progress that to nursing and um, mental health. You'll be aware through um, reports of IGIM and, and other reports of the work of the, the cyber plan and, and the work that's progressing to make sure that we have safe um, and sustainable as as far as possible and we've got a continuous programme of improvement in line uh, with best practice and, and national guidance. And then it describes um, our cloud migration and our legacy from the old um, uh, areas of um, Swansea University or private, sorry, Cardiff University or private providers to um, being managed and responsible for in-house. And that's actually going to go through an internal audit process um, I think it's this quarter so you'll receive further impact and on other people's views I guess on how we've done on that not just us saying it's gone quite well um, but we're really pleased with the progress we have made in quite a complicated change and um, a real step forward there for the way that that's done in NHS Wales and finally we give an overview of the digital transformation and I think this is the one that really links back to the audit report of last time because this offers each of the departments opportunity to really digitize processes and ways of working so we're starting with the SharePoint migration but then this will be followed with a plan of further digitization of our processes and ways of working within uh, the department and moving away from manual or paper processes within the organization and that's possible through our national um, arrangements with the Microsoft 365 uh, contract. And finally, then um, we give an overview of how we will be describing this in the digital and data strategy. This is sort of um, being developed now. The aim of, is to have the strategy ready by the end of the financial year. We are planning engagement events and conversations during the autumn uh, to bring early draft back um, at the beginning of the new calendar year um, and to discuss that with audit committee and the board and lining that up so we can get and describe that shape um, and direction for the digital strategy in um, HOW. The paper then describes the governance and the risks and how we manage it across the three main pillars of, um, first of all, IGIM, <coughs> which you'll be familiar with, uh, the digital transformation leadership group and our own risk management within the, organ within the department and organisation. And then it briefly references the financial work that's happening across Wales. But as we develop our strategy and our plans, we will be working closely with finance colleagues. And they were very supportive on that um, all Wales piece of work. But as the paper describes, that should be caveated because we are getting into the level of detail and that will be a process that's revisited to support the strategy, but also our implementation plans. Um, so yeah, a brief overview of the paper. I'm not sure if there's any questions or um, it's it's a high level overview with this paper and we can bring back more specific updates on areas um, should the committee wish. Thank you, Sean. Very helpful. Um, okay, other questions? Thanks, Sean. I found the paper um, very, very helpful and um, a couple of questions in relation to this being a board agenda. I mentioned to you yesterday, forgive me, but uh, at a, a meeting we had in Carmarthen and looking at our strategic objectives, where, where do we scrutinise the level of compassionate leadership and digital learning, um, as I outlined to you yesterday, because I can't see it within this programme. When you look at the objective one to five, 
it might be implicit within each of those objectives, but I think you agreed with me yesterday, it's an area that we do need exploration of. So I just wondered if that could be incorporated in this before this paper comes to board. Yeah, um, that's fine. Um, the area where it will be incorporated. So if we're talking about compassion of digital learning in particular, the TDSQ will have an evaluation framework established of the content and the implementation of learning um, and, and, to, and to understand if that is the best approach. So that's built into the um, TDSQ, uh, TDSQ implementation plan. Um, and then I think it's a broader um, opportunity to influence some of the wider implementations of digital ways of working because whilst that was is in the remit of HOW, the actual implementations of new IT systems for clinical use, I think our role there is to, is to support where well, we've got a definite deliverable and we can describe that clearer um, in, in the TDSE implementation. So that, that was listed in the paper, hang on, as... Yeah, three point one. Yeah, um, so it'd be helpful to see. And actually, would that come to board then? Um, I'm quite yes. I, I guess I'd, I'd take direction from the committee as if this is something that the board would like to further um, progress and, and to present to board. Um, I'm happy with with that approach. If if you think that would be something that is required. Yeah, I think um, once we've done the information governance part, so we can pick that up at the end of the next item. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. I'll pick up it. Okay, all right. Thank you, Sean, <clears throat> for that. And so um, loads going on, and, um, and my question was going to be about links to finance, and because um, I, I, I think it would be really um, important to see how we're going to actually um, find the resources to deliver everything we want to. So, um, so I'm looking forward to seeing seeing that all come together. So thank you. Um, you're staying, aren't you, for the next item? Yeah. So we'll perhaps wrap, wrap it all up um, at the end of that. So if we move on to the information governance and implement information management key issues report. David, are you taking this? I am. Thank you, Chair, uh, Dr. Cadillac. Uh, so the report provides a summary of the deliberations of the Information Governance and Information Management uh, Group, which is held on the 23rd of June. Um, the key area is that were considered, uh, included um, the audit recommendation tracker, which is considered separately on today's agenda. Um, the update on HRW's information governance delivery uh, plan uh, and implementation plan um, and good progress was noticed, uh, was noted. In particular, uh, we welcome the fact that the information governance toolkit level two compliance rating had been confirmed by DHCW. Um, we received uh, a thorough update with regards to the work undertaken around cybersecurity. Um, and noted the successful uh, rollout um, of added and increased security measures. Um, we received the Information Governance Data Breach Report, which identified two reported breaches, uh, none of which were deemed to reach the threshold for reporting to the Information Commissioner's Office. Um, one complaint uh, was made to the ICO relating to a request for rectification uh, which was not uh, deemed to be actioned uh, in a timely manner, and that rec uh, rectification has now been completed. Uh, we also received an update with regards to freedom of information requests, uh, and over the reporting period, we received four FOI uh, requests, all of which were uh, responded to within time. Um, we also uh, considered a, a complaint that had been made to the ICO, which had been uh, subject to an investigation by the ICO. Uh, and it was good to note that on the substantive point of determining whether we were right to withhold financial information um, that was requested, um, the ICO confirmed that HAW was entitled to um, withhold the information that had been requested. Um, however, the uh, ICO did find that HOW was in breach uh, of Section 10 of the FOIA due to a delay in providing uh, 
information relating to um, variation of those orders. Uh, so the paper is is for noting. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. David. Just one, one quick question, it just just to refresh my my memory. Um, the the activities undertaken under the delivery and implementation plan for this year includes uh, work focused on ensuring that those with key information governance roles were empowered to carry out their roles. It's good to see the work being done, but I, I just couldn't recall what initiated that particular action as a as part of the planned activity. Was there a particular challenge that had been raised by staff as part of their performance appraisals, for example, that indicated that they didn't feel empowered or was this just something part of a or something else? I, I, I just I couldn't remember what the background was. No, if I remember correctly, no, 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 no there's no kind of concern with regards to that. I think it was kind of more of a kind of we were just confirming green light to go ahead with regards to um, the members of each directorate who were joining the group, um, that that was now up and running and that they were now pro progressing, um, being full members of the group and going back to their directorates and reporting of the good work that's undertaken by the group. So it's more of a confirmation that, that, that the group is... is fully up and running now and that we've got those representatives from each director uh, playing their, their their role in full. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. No, I was going to, the amount of mandatory training was 74 percent When do we think we'll get to the 90% target? That's only in quarter one. That sort of links to my question or comment, I suppose, which is um, something I've raised before, David, in, in terms of this group, and I don't know whether, Sean, you want to think about this. Um, there's loads of good work going on, so I wouldn't want to, to sort of um, pretend that it isn't moving in the right direction. I just wonder if there's some sort of way that this could be be presented in terms of what you're trying to achieve. So what are the targets? It kind of links to both Tina's and John's questions, which is what when when will you know when you've got there almost? What what does what does good in some of these areas look like? And so can we just twitch it a little or turn it a little bit into a little bit more of this is what where we want to be and this is where we are in terms of progress on that trajectory does that make sense it, it, it does obviously um, what we're currently providing you with is a summary of, um, uh, of the deliberations of the group but I, I, um, I'm sure Sean will take on board what you're saying uh, so obviously when we're summarizing that work we'll obviously take on board uh, the, the feedback that we're getting that you'd like a, a greater emphasis in terms of the uh, our, you know, ultimate aims and objectives of the group in terms of where we want to get to. So um, we, we can take that on board. Thank you. That would be useful because, because whilst you know, I'm really impressed with all all the stuff that, that's going on. Are we missing anything, or is there something that we're not achieving? So just just to so that the audit committee's got a, a feeling of, of we 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 got there almost. So perhaps perhaps if we bring that back to the next. Audit committee, um, Sean David, if that's if that's appropriate. But I think in terms of um, if we do that, I think <coughs> I think if I I've got it right from members of the audit committee, Sean, is that um, moving now into the digital strategy takes it into board territory, um, perhaps um, and. The audit committee have taken a really keen interest in all this because obviously it was such a red risk and we wanted to make sure that progress was happening. So I think subject, I'm, I'm talking um, for, for my colleagues here, but please, um, please say if not, if we have perhaps this report coming back just to demonstrate where we are on and then perhaps we can sign that off at the, the October audit committee and perhaps step down. Um, I know you love the audit committee, Sean, but um, but perhaps step step down the digital update because I think there's such progress being made that 
I I don't think it's it's appropriate. Yeah, and Chair, I think that's a really good idea. I mean, there's there's, there's a huge amount of really valuable progress in Sean's report, yeah. but obviously. You know, and I know she'll be reporting, I'm guessing, the stuff back to the main board anyway, but I think that's where it needs to sit because of the impact on the wider organisation and making sure our colleagues are aware yeah. of what this progress yeah. looks like. Now, there are obvious things in chance report, particularly around cyber security, for example, yeah. but obviously a form part of the risk register because that's a continuous red flag, um, and that naturally sits with us as part of our work as an audit and assurance yes. committee. But there's, in yeah. terms of the progress, you know, significant progress is clearly being made yeah. by Sean and the team. It, it's 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 superb to see it. But I think getting that back to the main board, which is where it really should sit, I think, going forward. Yeah. yeah. That's a really helpful steer. Thank you. And just on the information governance piece, just to remind um colleagues that hitting level two of the toolkit does describe our progress and and what we have achieved across a range of levels. So um and we've had that report. Uh, previously so that that kind of demonstrates what we were trying to get to and where we got to we, so we can summarize that again for the next meeting but I really do welcome your feedback on actually now describing some of this to the board and I think that will line up now with taking the strategy um, for um, engagement and approval through sort of the latter quarters of this um, uh, financial year so yeah thank you we'll, we'll take that on board. And I think it would be remiss of us not to record our appreciation at the level two. I yes. think we could probably um, not not done that formally and um, really well done. I mean, level two is not to be not to be sniffed at. And as you, as you pointed out to us, you only have to fall at one hurdle to not not achieve it. So that's really really good progress. So it was more around the other issues, I think, in terms of what what's what's the group for. What are they trying to do and, and all the rest of it? So, so thank you, Sean. Um, so that was, that was really, really helpful. So, well, Trish, um, just, to, just to clarify, the, the other issues that were, because it's obviously level two is quite broad, what are the other issues that are causing concern? No, the whole paper doesn't just cover the toolkit, it covers a number of other areas. So, it's just setting out what are we trying to get to on all the other areas. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, um, so are we happy to um, note the progress um, on the digital directorate and the key strategic areas, the robust governance systems, and also to note the contents of the information governance yes. report for assurance? Yes. Thanks, Thanks very much, Sean. Okay, so if we move now on to item 2.4, the Audit Wales Progress Report. So I'll hand over to Helen and Andrew. Thanks, um, Chair. So I'll take the first part of the report. Um, so thanks for having us today. Um, so just an update on our accounts work for 21-22. So um, as you know, we received the draft accounts in April, the end of April, and we completed our audit and reported that to you at the last audit committee. Subsequent to that, the board approved the financial statements um, and the Auditor General certify the financial statements on the 17th of June and they were laid before the Senate on that same day as well. Um, we've also completed um, the some of the returns, for example, for the whole of government accounts. So that's been done and our two recommendations were included within our audit of accounts report, which management have accepted and agreed to work on for next year. So that um, concludes our audit of the 21-22 accounts. So we will be having quarterly liaison still with the chair, chief executive and chair of audit. Um, we've also met with Tina um, as part of her induction to the committee as well. So um, yeah, that's, that's just about that for this point. I'll then hand over to Andrew. Thanks, Helen. Um, yeah, in terms of the performance audit update, um, Exhibit 2 highlights the work that's currently underway, which is the structured assessment. Um, I did just recently um, confirm uh, the progress with it. So um, in, in terms of the delivery of it, it's going, going well. Uh, we have one outstanding interview, which is um, yet to be arranged, um, but we're looking to try and push that forward. So um, ideally then we'll be able to get the um, 
the the audit report subject to to moderation uh to the october audit committee uh, we will obviously need to go through clearance process so it'll take uh, some time to do that but um hopefully we'll be able to get it to the october audit committee and exhibit three uh that highlights the work uh, not yet started um so it's, it's uh, a bit of a, a bit of work focusing around workforce planning arrangements it was included in the plan um split into two main parts one is around heiw's own workforce planning arrangements that that local work will be delivered um, within the calendar year um, there's a wider uh, element of work which is more relating to heiw's um, more strategic responsibilities for, for supporting workforce planning across wales um, and that will be undertaken uh, slightly later, um, so towards the end, uh, mid, mid to end of, of the financial year. Uh, and the reason being is that we need to undertake um, the workforce planning reviews, which are undertaken across Wales, so across all 12 bodies. We need to have those completed before we can undertake that, that broader piece of work. Um, so that's the, uh, the, the work that we have in the programme. Uh, just really wanted to highlight in Exhibit 4, uh, we had a report uh, on tackling the plan care backlog in Wales. Um, there's a, a short summary of that included in Appendix 1. Uh, one of the key messages that came out from that work is some of the challenges around uh, workforce capacity across the system. Um, and there's quite immediate pressures, and I think it's probably well known, there are quite immediate pressures right now. Um, but there is also a need to build uh, a sort of uh, a strategic and resilient workforce over the medium to longer term as well. So uh, there's probably some messages in there around um, uh, how the organisation HGRW um, works with partners and um, alongside Welsh Government plans um, to help coordinate how the, those, those um, workforce needs are met. Um, the, the, the paper again is for, for noting, but very happy to uh, take any uh, questions or, or, or comments. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Questions? Yeah, Tina? Thanks. Um... I had very interesting um, meetings in relation to um, my induction, so thank you very, very much because it, it suddenly, it, it did broaden my understanding. One of the questions I have in relation to um, the audit going forward about workforce is looking at, at our strategic 10-year workforce plan where it's split into three, um, er, three and triennial delivery points. I just wondered whether the um, Audit that you're going to be undertaking is going to look at the performance of HIW against the, the launch that happened in October 2020 and the outcomes and the impact that COVID may have had. But also importantly, going forward, our own workforce, because we've we've just submitted a mental health workforce plan to the Welsh Government for consideration, which again will be in um, the second phase of our strategic plan and whether or not we're going to have the workforce deliverables within HIW um, to be able to deliver on each of those um, uh, challenges that may be forthcoming. So I hope you get the drift of my question is, we, we've had a 10 year strategy, how have we measured up against the intent that was launched in October 2020 and will that be part of the audit? We'll, we'll, we'll certainly consider the, the sort of the initial implementation of the strategy and plan and the progress against it um and that's sort of a combination of your 10-year strategy as well as the imtp and we'll consider those alongside each other uh, i suppose there, there's in terms of that that, that 10-year strategy um there's a, a question in our minds at the moment which is uh sort of separating out is this a a, a, a strategy for workforce for wales health and social care or is this HEIW specific strategy? Um, and I think it's important for us to be able to, to um, look at those with slightly different lenses. Um, clearly, as part of that, um, it's part of the strategic direction of um, the body. So uh, it's fundamentally important to, to the board to monitor um, and track progress. Um, as I said in, in the update, one of the reasons that uh, we can't undertake that more strategic bit until sort of a bit later um, is exactly that. You, you will want to understand not only around delivery of the strategy, but actually is it achieving the outcomes that are intended? And the only way we can really do that is by actually understanding from the bodies, the other bodies that we're auditing around whether that, that strategy is starting to have the impact that, that is expected. Um, appreciating it's a work in progress, so it is two years or two to three years within a, a, a ten year, wider 10 year strategy. Um, I think we will be able to comment on early progress and look at risks and challenges that come out of that. That's, kind of, that's really helpful, Andrew, from the perspective of 
the link between health and social care, because that's the reason I was asking the question, because when you look at the social care workforce and also the challenges that they're currently experiencing and listening to some of our stakeholders, it'd be helpful to know going forward that if we haven't been able to achieve for the first couple of years, how are we going to develop the mental health workforce plan, which is based on the health and social care workforce coming together? And where should the governance arrangements be for the accountability of that? So it, it, what I'm saying is, the so what? If we've had two years of working with health and social care, what have been the challenges that we need to address in order to preempt what potential challenges there might be for the workforce delivery plan in mental health if it's going to be accepted by Welsh government? I know it's internally within them at the moment. Because I'm listening to stakeholders, I know, for example, there's been no mapping at all between each of the 22 local authorities as to what challenges they face in their workforce linking to the social care, the corporate government agendas, governance agendas there. They've not mapped that out in particular regions in Wales either. So we don't know what the challenges are within social care for us to be able to deliver the bigger, um, I guess, workforce strategy. And from our perspective, Health Education Improvement Wales working with our stakeholders and listening to that feedback, there are immense challenges within those domains where we haven't got a unified template of what we're seeking. I asked a couple of questions as to whether that had been monitored or whether there had been a review of um, the differences between the, each of the local authorities. And it, it doesn't exist apparently. And yet how can we then have a workforce plan which is having a unified all Wales model um, trying to model um, where we get our workforce from going forward. I hope you get my drift on where I'm coming from, because that, that's a really big issue if we're going to seek to deliver on the workforce for the future. I, th I think that's that's a, a really, really good point. Um, the, the, the governance arrangements around delivery of that strategy are, are inherently complex. Um, and in terms of the monitoring you know, of that strategy, there will be a responsibility with, within HEIW, but it will also cut across social care Wales and, and in part the, the um, health boards and local authorities. Um, so in, in terms of, I suppose, look at, looking at it from a, a governance perspective, uh, probably I would say more, more work might well need to be done um, to, to ensure that each of the, the discrete sort of parts of the jigsaw, the partners are coming together. Um, and there is that collective oversight at the moment. It, as, as you say, it doesn't feel like there is, but until we've delivered the work, we can't, can't be certain on that. Thanks very much. Let's have some thanks. Okay. Um, I've just got a couple of points, Andrew, um, if I may. Building on Tina's, I suppose, is, um, uh, I suppose, are you looking back on the strategy or are you helping us to look forward? Um, is a fundamental question for me. So, um, so that's the first one. The second is how are you bringing social care and social services into the equation um, in the piece of work? Because otherwise um, it, 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 it won't help in, in many respects. And I think the third bit, which is something that um, you, you um, just touched on at the beginning, I wonder if we could have something um, outside of the, you know, uh, um, I don't want to labour the point now, in terms of timing of all this, so we can get a feel for how it'll inform either our backwards look or our forwards look. So could we have a timetable for what's expected when, um, in terms of the pieces of work, so that we, we've got a feeling of how it will feed in perhaps to next year's INTP or whatever. Does that, does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of, um, I guess, are we discreetly looking at the strategy where we will be looking broader at sort of wider, the wider workforce planning as a subject area, as a thematic, this, obviously we will need to look at strategy and as, as we will do across the other, um, 11 bodies as well. Um, so we will need to consider that. I think probably the most important thing is for us to identify the risks and challenges that are facing the workforce at the moment and marry that up against um, the, the activity within the NHS, across the NHS, to help manage those workforce challenges and, and, and risks. Um, so it, it, it's not going to be a discrete audit of the strategy, but that obviously is a fundamental part, um, you know, is, is absolutely fundamental for us to, to deliver the work. Um, 
In terms of uh, how we capture um, social care, that's going to be a lot more of a challenge for us. We can do it from a top down perspective um, and um, we are intending to, to, look at, to look at that from a national and social care Wales angle. Um, it's, it's a lot harder for us on the 22 local authorities. This, this work isn't programmed in specifically on, on the local authority perspective, um, but we can look at it from a national, from a governance and a national perspective, um, and particularly focusing around uh, social care Wales and their own governance arrangements as part of that. Um, and then finally, on, on the, the timing, absolutely, I, I think um, probably the best approach um, to, to sort of formalise that will be if, if we prepare a PID and within the project initiation document um, or terms of reference, um, we, we communicate um, the intended timeline within that. Um, clearly, as, as in with any audit programme, um, we've, we've got a requirement to continually assess risk across um, the NHS, and that does sometimes require reprioritisation, but there's nothing to stop us um, outlining our intent in terms of timeline for delivery of the work, not only sort of from a uh, uh, view of HGIW's own work programme, I think it would make sense to, to um, sort of outline it for, for the whole of NHS Wales, so it, it brings everything together in, in a broader picture, if, that, if that's helpful. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I'm driving at, which is when will you get the full picture, and I guess it would be helpful, I think, to articulate to us what what, what it's intended to do. So um, how will it how will it assist us in some ways, or is it purely because I know Helen will tell me um, that sometimes there are pieces of work that are just for assurance for the Auditor General rather than for the audited body sometimes. So it's what what's intended from the piece okay. of work. What, what can we get from it? Well we'll, well, we'll communicate that through um, a terms of reference document. So um, in, in some respects, I think it might be worth then when we share it with um, executive colleagues across NHS Wales, um, that um, at that same time that you're included in, in um, that communication as well. And you can see it right from the, from the start, if that's okay. That'd be really helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions, please? Okay, so um, are we happy to note the Audit Wales Progress Report? Yes. Okay, lovely, thank you. Um, so moving on to the procurement compliance report, item 2.5. Um, I think Rhiannon and Janine are going to take this. Thank you. Janine, are you happy to pick this one up? I am, yes, Rihanna. Thank, thank you. And many thanks, Chair. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present the procurement compliance report. So hopefully you've all had an opportunity now to review the report, which um, reflects on procurement activity that was undertaken during the period 28th of May to the 15th of June, that we are required to present um, for assurance to the Audit and Assurance Committee in line with at one point, um, reference 1.2 of your standing financial instructions. So if I can draw everyone's attention to uh, Appendix 1 and reflect on just one award that was made during this period of additional funding outside of the terms of the contract. And the summary of information reflects the details that this was undertaken for workforce, where there was a contract uh, change control notice with regards to a requirement for additional support in relation to compassionate leadership for health and social care. So you can see their capture that this was undertaken by means of a change control notice. And that is the only one that we are reporting on uh, on this occasion, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Any comments? Janine, just for my, my information, um, why was the period only three weeks or whatever it was? So for this purpose, there, there was a contract award made under a single tender action for a set expenditure for Michael West with regards uh, providing that support for um, compassionate leadership. And the demand for Michael West services um, 
grew exponentially greater than what was originally anticipated. Therefore, there was a need to um, make reference to that additional value. So we needed to extend the value of that original contract award, albeit it has been acknowledged there will be a continued need for Michael West services, but this will be picked up by means of a separate STA. So this is with reference to a change control notice to increase the value of the original STA chair. And, and I know that there's a time period where which you cover in between the audit committees. Did you say it was from the 28th of May to the 15th of June? Why was it just that period? Why wasn't it from April, our last audit committee? No, it wasn't, sorry, June um, through to now. Is, it, is there a reason why it was that? Yes, yeah, so during June's audit committee, we presented the report up to the 28th of May um, when, when we met last month. And so it was just a short period now where we are meeting this month. So we, we, we did present on all procurement activity up to the 28th of May in, in the June meeting. Thank you. OK, I think... Um... I know we discussed these um, single tender actions and um, I, we've seen quite a few of, of these coming through, haven't we now? So I think we just need to keep our eye closely on, on, on these. Um, I'm sure you will as well, um, because I don't know how much the total is now, um, but I think it's probably starting to get quite significant. Yeah, on this occasion, this is a change control notice of a previous STA. Um, so this is a change control as opposed to an STA. But take on board um, your, your considerations, Chair. And, and I agree um, wholeheartedly with that consideration. And we are actively working with all directorates within HEIW um, to understand and, and make sure that the use of an STA is, is absolutely a necess necessity and that where possible we are driving competition within the market or if competition isn't available that in advance of that we are looking to grow the market so that they are able to compete for future business. Thank you Jenny. Change control notice worry me more than single tender actions actually. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, um, okay. Are you happy to note the report for assurance? Yes. Thank you both. Okay. Um, all right. Item 2.6, counter fraud, Garrett. Yeah. Hi. Good morning. Sorry, my video. So there we are. Hi. Good morning. Yeah. The counter fraud progress report. Um, this report covers the period from the 1st of April 2022 to the 20th. 20th of June 2022. Just to give you, I'll, I'll take it that you've all read the report, but uh, I'll, I'll pick out the salient points. Um, so at the 20th of June, we had provided 23 days counter fraud work to the organization. This was mainly um, spent on strategic work and planning or infrastructure building towards the um, aims within the annual work plan. But also eight days were spent investigating. Uh, I'll come on to that in a moment. The, the, the investigation days were all spent with regards you know, uh, in the arena of the um, nurse student nurse bursaries. So where we're at at the moment, the annual counter fraud report has now been completed and will be presented shortly after this uh, and has been approved by uh, the executive director of finance. The, the annual plan was um, uh, shared at the last audit committee meeting and that was approved by audit committee. So those are both now in place. The functional standards return has been completed in relation to the organization which is a reporting mechanism to the counter fraud authority um, that's completed and been signed off by both the audit chair and the executive director of finance and myself. Um, staffing, we are up to speed with staffing within the Cardiff and Vale department. Um, we now have myself as the counter fraud manager and three full time fraud investigators in relation to the annual plan or the infrastructure development we've made thus far in relation to the annual plan, just a couple of things. We've created a generic email address in order to give a further reporting route for individuals 
or staff members within the organization. We've created a comprehensive activity database. This, this essentially will assist us in collating figures um, and reporting upon our activity, which saves a fair bit of time um, backtracking and chasing. Uh, we have a new up-to-date interactive counter-fraud inquiry form and awareness session request form with QR coding attached. So we kind of spent a bit of time modernizing ourselves in, in essence. Um, we've reviewed the digital presence the counter-fraud have, and as that was found wanting, I think, at the, uh, in previous years, and in liaison with the communications department, um, we've, we've made... Um, progress with regards to how we're going to get our message out to staff members within the HIW with things such as a bi-monthly counter-fraud newsletter that is put out internally in HIW. Um, a joint working protocol has been um, signed and uh, agreed between myself and Paul from internal audit. With regards to e-learning arrangements, we found that um, uh, there is no sort of mandatory training in relation to counter fraud, although there is a module on the ESR system. As a result of that, we've looked at other methods that we can try to get this get staff to undertake the training. And we have development of a learning platform, um, a counter fraud learning platform at on the Learning at Wales site uh, currently under development, hopefully to be completed within the next quarter. Uh, corporate induction. Um, we have now uh, ha have an agreement in place that we will present at all corporate induction. Um, discussions have been held with Rhiannon and um, Martin in relation to fraud risk within the organization. So fraud risk descriptors have been shared with uh, Martin and Rhiannon and also discussions have been undertaken with regards to mandate and invo invoice fraud. <laughs> Uh, in relation to alerts and bulletins, we have put out three fraud alerts to the organization, which are shown in the appendices. Uh, one was in relation to mandate frauds that generally attack um, shared services partnership. However, they're pertinent to all organizations. Um, there was uh, an alert put out in relation to a prevalent scam, which had been sent to some members um, of staff in another health organization in relation to Dell computing. and another alert was put out in relation to an ESR phishing scam that was uh, being perpetrated uh, across uh, NHS organizations within the UK. Uh, there's also been one bulleting which has been issued to the University of Wales student nurses um, or, or the student nurses cohort at all the universities within Wales. Um, and that's based upon the uh, student nurse bursary investigations that we've been undertaking, which I'll come on to shortly. With regards to awareness sessions, um, two, gen two general fraud aware uh, awareness sessions have been delivered, delivered at corporate induction, which have hit a total of six, 17 uh, staff members and further arrangements are underway to deliver further sessions. Uh, one newsletter has been produced thus far, which can be seen at Appendix 5. Uh, there has been one fraud prevention notice issued by the Counter Fraud Authority during this reporting period, which detailed the risks associated to credit card terminal fraud taking place. And this was at another NHS organization. Um, a brief investigation was carried out with regards to HIW, and there were no findings of uh, any risk being borne by the organization. And that has been reported on the clue date place accordingly and closed down. There has also been one intelligence bulletin which has been issued which was issued in relation to an imposter who was acting as a consultant doctor, uh, providing educational services externally to NHS providers and inquiries carried out by the counter fraud department um, found that this person was, had not uh, had any involvement with HIW. Uh, we've received no referrals via the online inquiry form from HIW staff during this period, which would suggest that we need to um, publicize ourselves a little bit better within the organization. With regards to in investigations, at the 1st of April, we had zero investigations open at HEIW. In this reporting period, five new, new referrals have been received. One of these was historic and had wrongly been reported against uh, the Valindra 
organization that has now been switched to HIW. Um, all of them are in relation to student nurse bursary fraud. Um, three of them were quickly found not to be fraudulent and uh, no further action was take, taken in regard of those three cases. The, with regards to the two remaining cases, one has been referred to the count, uh, to the Crown Prosecution Service for, for a decision to be made with regards to whether a prosecution follows. Both of the uh, cases have been referred to the nursing directorate at the university where the fraud has take, taken place. And both of these individuals are going to face fitness to practice uh, hearings in the near future. Karen, can I yep. just, just to check? David, just um, reaffirm, we, we're okay in open session with this? Uh, that's, as, that's as deeply as I was uh, going to cover it, Jill, in this session. Okay, I just wanted to check that it was okay. All right, sorry to interrupt. That's okay. Uh, that, that pretty much uh, covers the progress report and the progress made by the counter fraud team thus far. So if there are any questions, then um, please feel free. Thanks. Karen. Thank you. 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 Thank
on, on that point, Martin, I'm just wondering whether it's worth us all sort of getting together and chatting that through. Yeah. Because I think that I think it's a really valid, valid point if that if that's appropriate. With if if I could come in there, Jonathan, with I think with regards to that, I, I should have added actually in the, the progress report there that I did have a meeting last week with the internal audit, audit department from shared services, which kind of touches on the subject I think you're, you're getting at there. In, uh, and we have now an agreed plan in place moving forward to um, a risk assessment taking place within shared services with regards to the bursaries, which is a, mainly will be led by internal audit, but will then involve account of fraud input once the um, information has been uh obtained by them so i think that kind of touches on that area so we are trying to sort of develop work within those sort of cross boundary areas if you like thanks Gareth. that's really really helpful thank you. yeah thank you Gareth. tina can i come in on that one as well sorry um thank you chair um i actually met with the director of finance of shared services recently as well um and they've had extensive um internal audit review of the student award systems and they um or he said that they'd be happy to share those um reviews with us to give us assurance that i suppose they are um i suppose under scrutiny over their systems and processes internally within shared services as well thank you, yes, thank you Leanne. that might be appropriate um if, if they have got an audit report that it comes to the audit committee Give us some assurance. Thanks. Perhaps you could have a conversation with Andy. Yeah, but I think it would still be useful to sit down and go because it's wider than just the bursary, isn't it? The, our reliance on it. There's, yeah. Tina, I think that's important given that um, the bursary is also extended to allied health professionals and the links with the universities. And their role. I think that's important in the contracting process. I just wonder, given the complexity of the um, report that we just received, what assurance have we got that we've got sufficient um, contracted uh, days to deliver on, like, on this yeah. agenda? Um, because if we've got priorities, I would, I would want assurances that the priorities don't take over, I know they are important, but they don't take over the normal day-to-day -day running of what we need to be assured on as well. And just wonder whether there's any monitoring in place to see what whether or not the number of days that we've got um, will be sufficient and also projecting forward whether we need to um, be mindful of that and, and alter that. Absolutely, that was my question because we've already used, so 23, out of 50 days and we've only two and a half months into the year so yeah i i, I to, to sort of come in on that point i think i know rihanna wants to speak about that as well i mean essentially i, I think everybody's aware of the situation we're in as a department with the organizations we provide this service to so um yeah the reason there's been 23 days used as opposed to say 15, which which would have been the case, was basically around the investigations that have taken place. And investigations will always be resource heavy on days. So it doesn't take many investigations to you know, take yourselves past that sort of 50 day mark. What I would say is, is if you do require further days, I, it's difficult for my department to provide those because we're at our absolute limit in providing the days that we do to all the other organizations. So it's the same for all those organizations as, as uh, I think, I think everybody's aware of that. I'm not sure. Yeah, Nancy, you want to come in before we come back on that? Sorry, was that, was that me? Sorry, I didn't hear you very well. Do you want to come in on that before we say anything more? Yeah, thank you. So I think, um, you know, it's us, us as an organisation to review our requirement, really, and I think it is constantly under review. Um, I think once we've finished the sort of risk-based work um, and un fully understood that we hold, I suppose, as HEIW, then we can make a better assessment of whether 
that is um, a sufficient requirement. And it may be that we can't um, access that capacity from Gareth and his team, but um, you know, there may be other options that we need to consider. Um, but at the moment, I suppose we're not, we're not clear because um, we haven't been through those risk assessment pieces of work, uh, exactly what our, our requirement could be. Okay, that, that's really helpful actually, and I think that's very sound. Um, and I guess it would bring in the questions about reliance on others and whether there's an issue there as well. So perhaps we do need to put that all together and then assess. I, I, I understand completely, Gareth, what, what you're saying is that, you know, you, you can ask, but, but we can't necessarily um, deliver. So we understand um, your position, but um, and I think we can have that conversation then, can't we, when we're... Yep. Um, in terms of investigations, um, is there a sort of set um, sort of number of days that you'd be expected to deliver an investigation in? I know they're not all the same, but is there some... No, some... I, I would never put a, a, a time limit on an investigation because every indiv investigation is individual. And, uh, you know, some, for example, some in the past have taken me up to two years to complete, whereas some take a week. And I appreciate that's different in every you know, in, in different types of um, different types of um, offences. But to give you an example um, of those two uh, student bursary frauds that we looked at, the one that has proceeded to the Crown Prosecution Service actually was carried out over the course of an 18 month period. Um, I appreciate that wasn't reported to HIW previously because it was wrongly reported within the sphere of Valindra. But then the second one was was uh, investigated over the course of a three to four week period. So, and that's just based around the the, the uh, existing sort of circumstances in each investigation and the actions of the person and the time scale it takes to get certain information from different external agencies and so on and so forth. So, it'd be very difficult to to to, to say, oh, that's that, you know one of those investigations is going to take seven days. I, I wouldn't like to do that. How is it quality controlled? Uh, well, I manage the investigations. Um, the team carried them out and I manage them and it's then reported on the Clue reporting system. I'm not sure what oversight the counter fraud authority have in, actual, in actually um, monitoring the level of the investigation, but I think you'd be reliant upon myself as the manager of them to, uh, to do that. Yeah, yeah, no, sorry, I'm not, I'm not question, I'm not certainly not questioning um, these investigations or anything. It's just a general question. Perhaps you could come back with, yeah. um, you know, what, what's the quality control on in terms of um, time and outcomes and all the rest of it. Yeah, okay. And, and don't misunderstand me. I completely understand how difficult investigations are. So not coming from a sort of a, a purist point of view. Any other questions, guys? No? no. Okay. Thank you very much. Did you want to move on to the annual report? Yeah, the the, the uh, counter fraud annual report. I'll apologise. Firstly, this this normally I would aim to sort of present this at the first meeting of the year. Um, obviously, I wasn't in a position to do that, having not only started on the first of April, so it's been slightly delayed. But this report. Um, is in relation to obviously the last financial year, the 1st of April 2021 to the 31st of March 2022. I won't go through it all, um, but it, it is essentially it's broken down and written in accordance now with the requirements placed upon us by the Cabinet Office um, uh, standard requirements. And I would break it into two parts. Firstly, the summary of compliance, and this is essentially a duplicate of the counter fraud functional standard return uh, on which we are measured with regards to our compliance to their requirements. So there's some key points to, to bring out from that, I would suggest, and those are in the areas for um, the counter fraud bribery and corruption strategy that HIW currently use the Cardiff and Vale um, policy. Uh, and I will be reviewing that over the coming quarter it's due, it's due to be out of date in December um, and probably requires updating also. So that will be done 
um, in the near future. Whilst it, we are compliant or the organization is compliant or was compliant last year, that needs to be updated this year. In the areas of risk assessment, well, clearly not a huge amount of risk work has been done historically. We're aiming to address that in the coming year. That, that I've um, given a compliancy rating of AMBEM, and that, that's not necessarily based on the fact that the risk assessment, no risk assessment work hasn't been has been done. It's, it's more based upon the fact that um, the new methodology that we are supposed to adopt as a counter fraud team has not been followed uh, last year. Um, I've carried out training ex exercises with the team here, uh, and I'm quite hopeful and assured that that will be rectified now in the coming year. With regards to outcome-based metrics, there hasn't been a great deal in place in the past, although things are reported and measured and reported back to the counter-fraud service Wales. Um, it's been a little bit disjointed and haphazard, and that that's, goes back to what I said earlier in the progress report about putting together a um, a database, an easy and easily monitored database to see how well we are actually um, carrying out our work and measuring against certain things. So, for example, when I mentioned earlier that we had no um, referrals via the online um, awareness form, then obviously we can measure that we're not performing very well in that area. So that's something we're going to improve on in the coming year. Um, the, the other area to possibly touch on is where we're amber is uh, undertake detection activity. Generally, this type of activity is is in in your sort of bigger health board organisations, if you like, is carried out by specialist teams like the PPV team, etc., who will do do those sort of dives into those areas. With regards to HEIW, obviously we do the the NFI checks. Those are I've carried out a review of that in the first quarter now and. Those the the payroll uh, matches are complete. We're currently going through uh, the other matches that we are able to do. For example, into areas such as um, conflicts of interest, those sorts of areas. So that hasn't quite been completed yet. And obviously, this can form part of my discussions with Martin and Rian on moving forward in this year, with regards to whether there are any areas that um, might be pertinent for us to undertake any sort of detection activity. With regards to the allocation of resources, um, based based on the uh, information available to me on coming into the role, I'm able to report that um, 50 days work was spent as agreed with HEIW uh, over the course of the last year. They, they were carried out mainly with regards to strategic requirements, uh, such as attending audit committee meetings and writing audit committee reports. Um, and staff staff training, report writing, and then proactive work with re, in relation to fraud awareness sessions, publicity work, etc. The costs for the organisation are, are there in the report, um, and a breakdown of the investigative work areas shows that there were a total of zero investigations. Um, again, I would touch on the fact that obviously that one student bursary uh, investigation at the time of reporting in this report was actually allocated to Valindra. Um, to, and also during the period of last year, eight awareness sessions were delivered to staff members across the organization and total of 77 staff members were presented to. And that's about it for the annual report. Obviously I'll take any questions. Thank you, Gary. No questions, it's good. It's good. comprehensive and grateful to uh... Gareth for outlining you know, this to us and that meeting we had with him, Chair. And um, it's really good to see this report pull together. And bearing in mind that Gareth only started in April, this is uh, a, a, a huge amount of work has been done. And just a couple of things, um, Gareth, um, if I may. Um, there's quite a few dates in there that are um, well gone, so perhaps um, they need to be updated. There's the um, reference to some things happening in June and and um, quite a few times. So I would just wonder if those could be updated for the final version. Um, right. Um, the, the, I think there's about three in there. Um, and if we could just come back to the NFI, because I'm the only member, I think, that, that was here. 
um, Rhiannon, you may be able to help me here. Um, we've given assurance some time ago, because we're nearly into the next round of NFI mm. that we collected this October. We were given assurance as an audit committee that all the matches, because I asked yeah. Yeah. times, all the matches have been investigated. Yeah. I think I think the assurance provided was in relation to, I think historically, the only matches that have been undertaken by this department were payroll to payroll matches, and I think that was the understanding previously. My uh, my personal view on it is there are other areas that require our our attention, and having carried out that review now in quarter one, there are some matches that I think that require us looking at. They're not they're not many. Um, but historically, um, from my understanding of NFI, they should be carried out by this team. And there's obviously been a misunderstanding previously um, as to the areas that should have been carried out by this team. That's, that's helpful. Thank you, Gareth. Um, and um, presumably you'll um, report back should there be anything. Yeah, certainly will, yeah. Okay, lovely. So are we happy to um, note um, both the progress report and the annual report? Yes. Thank you. Okay, we've still got quite a bit um, on the agenda to, to go. So if we move on swiftly to 2.7, the review of standing orders. David, are you taking this or? Yeah. I am chair, sorry, I was muted there. Um, I, I had asked if we were going to consider taking the audit tracker paper early, as Sean's just come back on the call. Can we see Sean? Oh, Sean. Sean, are you there? Okay, um, with everybody's permission, um, there is one, when we come to the audit tracker, <coughs> on the audit tracker um, out of sequence now then David if you want to move to 2.12 yes thank you uh, felly papur yw'r storiad ac sydd hefyd yn gofyn am gymryd y dwyeth ydy hon uh, mae'r system tracio yn cyfnodi ar gymhellion yn yr chwywyr mewnol ac allanol uh, ar hyn o byd mae yna 31 o ar gymhellion wedi gyfnodi um, o'r rhain mae deunaw uh, yn fewnol ac o'r rhai mewnol mae 14 wedi assessu yn wyrdd wedi gwblhau a 4 yn felyn ac mae un ar gymhelliad y gyllysdyrydd yn hwyr ac mae rhwng yn trawed yn ymhellach mewn eiliad. O ran yr argymhelliadau allanol, mae yna cyfanswm o ddeuddeg ohoni nhw, mae saith wedi assessu yn wyrdd a 5 ddim yn ddiledus eto a mae ganddo ni un cyfres o argymhellion cynghorol yn unig. Uh, felly, um, dyn ni'n gofyn uh, bod y pwyllgor yn ystyried y papur, uh, ond hefyd yn caniatau bod yr uh, argymhellion sydd wedi asesu'n wyrdd yn cael eu tynnu oddi ar y gofrestr. Ok, diolch gyda fi. Thank you, David. Ok, um, so, um, pleased to see that there's um, progress being made against some of the outstanding recommendations and um, and I know that um, um, there's a couple of workforce ones that have, have moved on significantly now. There's just the one um, big outstanding one which I think Sean you're going to talk us through. Yeah, happy to <laughs> so. Um, so it's in relation to the um, tracking <coughs> of IT assets. Um, within the organisation and um, there's been a programme of work, this is on our departmental delivery plan. Um, over uh, the last um, few months there's been um, an investigation into uh, solutions that we can pro to, to, to provide this um, service. We also went out to a procurement but unfortunately that procurement didn't prove successful. So now we have um, instigated an internal piece of work. Um, so the completion of the action as described in the audit tracker to have a single list um, will be, I can give assurance today, completed by the end of um, July. The team have given an update uh, this morning that that's um, happened and, and um, resources have been put onto that to focus the piece of work. So we will have a single list now by the end of July, that's on track. 
And then through the summer, there will be a data quality um, review of, of the assets included on that to make sure um, that, that the um, quality of that single list is improved through the summer. We do have robust and have had for a period so well, since um, being in post robust processes for new assets. And um, this was the legacy information, but can assure um, the audit committee that that will now be in place and good progress is being made. And by the next committee or the September committee, um, we will be able to, um, I'm sure, take this off the audit tracker. Lovely. Thank you, Sean. That's really helpful. Any questions on it? So are we happy? Sorry. Sorry, sorry, Martin. Didn't see you. Thanks, Chair. Um, I hadn't picked up that the, the two recent uh, audit recommendations from the annual accounts need to be added on. I don't like adding recommendations on, but they, they need to be need to be added to the external audit section. Well done, Martin. <laughs> they'll be added on the next cycle. Yeah, they'll be added on the next cycle. So, uh, so well there, uh, well spotted. Thank you. Okay, so um, are we happy to um, note the report, consider the progress and approve the recommendations um, that are green to be taken off? Yes. Great, lovely. Thank you. And thank you, Sean, for rejoining. No problem. Thank you. After you've gone, they're like, I've forgotten to do it. So um, thank you very much. No worries. Thank you. Okay, back to the... We've done the standing orders, um, but we haven't taken any questions on the standing orders. Were there any questions? Okay, so are we happy to review the amendments made and recommend the revised version to the board for approval in July? Yes. Yes, good, thank you very much. Okay, on to 2.8, the SFI standing financial instructions. Um, Rhiannon. I'll take that if that's okay. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Yeah, okay. Thanks very much. So in 2019, Directors of Finance established a subgroup to review standing financial instructions across NHS Wales, and they wanted to prepare a model set of SFIs for adoption. The subgroup comprised representatives from various groups, including finance, governance and procurement teams from both NHS Wales and from, from the Welsh Government teams, and they completed their work in 2021. At the Audit Committee in July last year, members were presented with the model SFIs for HRW for review and consideration, and if you recall, as part of that review, it was identified there was an issue with the notification and reporting requirements for procurement items in HRW, specifically for contracts over a million pounds. And as a result, we weren't able to adopt the model SFIs at that, that point. So since then, I've had a number of meetings with Welsh Government colleagues to review what we need in HAW, particularly on the procurement processes. And on the 31st of March this year, they issued revised guidance, which clarifies the re reporting requirements and essentially resolves the remaining issue and, and puts us back into the, the position we were originally when HAW was formed. So therefore, I'm, I'm presenting the revised model SFIs to the committee today for, for hopefully their final review and consideration. And I'm asking to propose that the committee recommends to the board that the revised FSF, SFIs are uh, adopted by HAW. So that's all I was going to say. I'm happy to take any questions on it. Thank you, Martin. I mean, this is an, not an insignificant piece of work. I mean, there's a huge amount of effort that goes into these and making sure that everybody understands them and complies with them, <laughs> dare I say. Um, so, first of all, thank you for all the, um, the hard work that I know goes into these. Um, and uh, sometimes it goes a little unnoticed, I'm sure, um, but they do keep us safe. So, um, any questions? I have no questions, Chair, except to echo a few remarks about uh, congratulations to Marty and Adam team and all, you know, all those beyond this building that have been involved in this because I think it's a very thorough piece of work. You can yeah. see that. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, it was really handy for me to have the, um, uh, the table setting out. Um, you know, where the changes were, yes. and I think just in terms of cross-referencing and finding things in the document, it made it much, much easier, just 
you know, running through a whole series of track changes. So that it was it was, it was really useful. It certainly gives the assurance as to how this process has worked. Yeah. Very effectively, actually. Very well presented. Um, that's a, a, a not easy to digest paper. Thank you. Um, okay, are we happy to um, review them and recommend them to the board to the next meeting? Yes. Board meeting. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks again. Can you pass on thanks to the team who've helped, Martin? Thank you. Um, okay, two point nine annual review of our risk management policy, David. Cadele, Vesci, Path Pir and Govinum, Gemera to the Hon, with Elote and Amy Bottle in Bodney and Adelaki in Policy Risk and Vonado, Redim and Cabuno, Nivelovan, Nevediate, Eleni, Seven Adliwerchir, Arkham Hession, and with Guid Gan Rajoviat, Arhulio Melno, are in Processor Risk, Vesci, Amar Amar, Nevediate, Honey with Yam Nessi in the Papir. Uh, we in Govan, you push got a study at the papir, our divigata are aesthetic, your policy risk. I can be not and Govan, but a push got a criminal gear, a policy really risk, our aesthetic. I would on Galica Vluino, ear a board and Miss Gofenab, um, committed with a score from that. Thank you, David. Um, comments. Just wondering, Chair, what process does this go through, and you know which groups of staff within the organisation are involved? I know that you know, risk management isn't something that tends to um, you know, excite many people, and uh, it just seems to be people sitting around this table and uh, those joining us virtually who get excited by mm -hmm. this area of work, and rightly so. Otherwise, we'd be in trouble if we didn't. Uh, but obviously, you know. The ocean of risk, the understanding of risk, how risks are mitigated is fundamentally important. And you know, as hard as it might be to grasp sometimes, you know, that, that ownership is so important amongst other people who sit beyond this particular committee room. So I'm just wondering what what are people do people get engaged in any way in this particular process and understanding what risk management policy actually means for your country? <coughs> Uh, how it impacts on staff and what the expectations are more, more broadly. Was more question. Um, I, I was happy with the changes, by the way. And I think, yeah. Again, a very thorough process. Yeah. And I, I, I couldn't see any disagreement with what was being suggested by way of change, but just a broader yeah. involvement of others, I suppose. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can I? Yeah. So, um, with regards to um, staff engagement, um, we. Um, in short, I think, um, I think it's going back uh, the last year um, that all managers of HRW undertook uh, a training, training undertaken by me with regards to the risk management policy. Um, so that's been done. We also uh, provide uh, refresher courses for, for the managers uh, with regards to, to risk, risk management, um, and any new managers are asked to attend risk management courses. And in fact, we had one um, yesterday. Um, with regards to the um, uh, the updates that have been considered uh, by the committee today, um, the, the policy was placed on the web and, and um, we asked for response back from staff with regards to the, uh, the, the proposed amendments. Um, so all in all, we do, we do feel that, you know, we, that the steps that were undertaken that we are ensuring quite good um, engagement from staff with regards to the risk management policy. Okay, I'm going to bring Paul in. Um, I think he's going to talk us through. Paul. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a comment from me. Really. I think you know, th these updates are really helpful and you know, help sort of uh, embed risk throughout the uh, throughout the organisations. Specifically, um, the, the the sentences talks about making it part of the induction process as well. So as as time goes on, then you get that sort of um, more more pervasive and, and um, approach to risk throughout the organisation and raising that general level of awareness. And uh, just to pick up on Jonathan's point, it, it might be that um, that um, some of those people, you know, it spikes an interest in their approach to risk, and they, they, you do get that sort of um, excitement that um, that that it, that it brings to auditors. Hey. You never know. <laughs> and I, I, Paul, I think absolutely right. I, I, thank you, Chair. I, 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 you know, that was 
always my ambition is to, you know, is for all members of staff to be equally excited to, uh, with risk management as, uh, as we are. But, it, you know, and Gav is right, the, the training aspect and the induction really fundamentally important. But the ownership of risk in each of those directorates, and I know that, you know, director of leads and managers will obviously take that responsibility for how, how those risks are managed, but it's also what are those ongoing, how does this feature as part of those ongoing staff discussions during the course of the year, as work evolves, as projects evolve, so that people understand that risks aren't just something that are captured in a in a document with a you know with a with a green and amber or a red color. It's something that they're actually actively involved in managing themselves. I, I think the training bit really important at the start, but obviously it, it's how you capture that as part of a of a yeah. continuous sort of pattern of their work, I suppose. But um, but no, I'm happy with it. I mean, it's it's it's, it's as thorough as it needs to be. Yeah. But, um, it's a cultural thing as much as anything else. It's getting people familiar um, and seeing it as just a general part of, of what they do day to day. Yeah. Without it being seen as a really boring, clunky, you know, difficult add-on that very few people tend to understand. Yeah. That's a challenge. Yeah. Absolutely. Rihanna. Yeah, I think, I mean, I was just going to say that as, um, I suppose, a programme management approach within HEIW, each and every programme of work has their own um, assessment of risk. There's a risk, um, I suppose, uh, a risk, I'm trying to think of the word, sorry, a risk matrix um, that is maintained for every one of those programmes. And then they all, and I, I'm pretty sure the directorates all have a risk um, assessment as well and a risk matrix. So they all put that up into, you know, the, the corporate risk um, management approach and, and then what you see presented in front of you. So I think we have embedded that sort of risk management um, ethos and approach through the organisation. And, and I think our programme management office is, is helping in that respect in terms of how all of those programmes are managed. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Anna. Sorry, Mike. My virtual hand isn't working, so uh, can, can I just uh, just just add to that? Um, so, at the point of induction, we do we do go through um, risk briefly, and the point is made to all members of staff that um, while obviously you'd expect the manager to lead on risk, risk is responsibility of um, everybody within HIW. Um, but I, I do take on board uh, the conversations. But obviously, it's an ongoing process. It's something that we need to continually focus upon to get right. We we, ne we can never be be happy um, with where we are. Uh, but clearly, we we are. I think we put um, the right steps in place to ensure that 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 uh, there is a good awareness among staff in terms of risk. And we also make the point that you know, please draw our attention to risk. Um, you know, we we we're not looking to shoot the messenger here. Um, uh, the, the corporate risk register and all the other registers are here to enable us to spot risks earlier. Uh, and the earlier that they're reported to us, the more likely that we can um, that we can focus upon them uh, and uh, be able to. Uh, to divert additional resource um, if, if required. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a perverse question, <laughs> if I could, which is um, whilst happy with everything and indeed the way it's embedded in HGIW, which is, I think, um, pretty well um, used and, um, and, and good. Perversely, I'm going to ask is the policy working? Because we've got too many risks in my view on the corporate risk register so whilst we've got the empowerment we've got the understanding we've got a huge number of risks and and that that isn't um where we should be so i'm just wondering is there anything that needs tweaking it may not be the policy, but perhaps you could hold that thought when we come on to the risk register. Question. So, so in terms of the policy, um, we've considered the proposed amendments and are we happy to support those amendments um, and recommend the policy to be approved at the July board? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, the risk register isn't next, sorry. Um, 210, um, the review of the Audit and Assurance Committee Terms of Reference, David. Yoch and Vaur, Pideri, the Vesli, Beth, Elodic, Pushkar, and we bought Dobbot and Arvada, but a Pushkar and Adluki, a Kilkorhul of another, 
Um, Dim newid sy'n cael ei ogrymu, uh, sef diweddariad i teitl y uh, cyfrwyddwr cyllid, uh, felly dyna'n gymryd pwyllgor i'r ystyried, ei cylch gorchwyl uh, ac i gefnogi'r y man newid gyfron. Os gwelwch yna. Dechore iawn cyda fi. Um, thank you, David. Um, Jonathan? Thank you, Chair. Uh, David, yeah, I'm more than happy to, you know, endorse the, the two very small changes that have been put into the document. Um, there was one point, just a clarification, and it, it just confused me. I, I'm just wondering whether this particular bit needs to be slightly more explicit. And I, 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 again, this may just be me misreading something. Um, the, the documents I've got, page number, are so two, two out of five. Um, it says the committee will support the board with regard to its responsibilities for governance, including risk and control, by reviewing and approving as appropriate. And the last bullet point says the policies and procedures for all work related to fraud and corruption as set out in National Assembly for Wales directions. Now, I, I just couldn't figure out what directions from the, as then the National Assembly for Wales that was referring to. I mean, there are obviously a whole suite of directions that are issued by Welsh ministers, but in terms of National Assembly for Wales directions, what does that refer to? Is that in relation to something that's passed in statute or in statutory instrument? I, I didn't quite get it. No. Um, and it may be terminology that may be used some years past, but I, I'm just wondering yeah. in, what, in, in what sense. Okay, thank you. I'll, I, I uh, I'll have to look into that and get back to you. I would be able to kind of go into detail on that now. I, I, apologies, but um, it's certainly long standing wording. And if we need to amend that, we'll, we'll review and get back to you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, you want to come back outside of the meeting on that, David? Yes, we'll do. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. And if they need amending, um, for the July board accordingly. Yeah, we'll, amend, we'll aim to amend it before the, uh, so that it's uh, incorporated in, in July board. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, moving on to 211, Corporate Risk Register. Okay, diolch yn iawn, Cadeirydd. Felly, ar hyn o bryd, mae yna 20 o risgau ar y Corporate Risk. O'r hain, mae pedwar yn goch uh, naw yn amber, yn oren. O ran y rhai coch, um, does na ddim newid ers y cyfarfod dwetha o'r pwyllgor, uh, felly mae un bris coch yn ymwneud gyda cyber diogelwch, uh, un yn ymwneud gyda visas ar gyfer meddygon teulu dan y ffordiant, um, uh, trydydd yn ymwneud gyda'r uh, proses o sicrhau geirda ar gyfer graddedigion meddygol rhyngwladol i'w galluogi fod ar y rhestr cyflawnwyr uh, meddygol. Uh, ac mae'r olaf yn ymwneud gyda cost yn y criwtio meddygon teulu um, a'r uh, ffaith i bod yn uwch na'r hyn ar y gwelwyd. Um, mae yna hefyd un risg newydd amber uh, sy'n ymwneud gyda'r cwrs uh, bidwragedd ym Mhrifysgol uh, De Cymru uh, a'r angen i symud y cwrs uh, um, ymlaen um, ym, yn yr ail lwyddyn i wneud yn siŵr i fod o um, gyson gyda gyfynion newydd y rhaglen byd uh, rhagedd y uh, dyfodol. Uh, felly, dyn ni'n gofyn uh, bod uh, pwyllgor yn ystyried y cof restr risg a'i nodi o'r sgolach yma. Okay, I mean, I've got a couple, just a couple of comments. My, my overriding concern is that we've got so many risks and that, that cannot be right for a corporate risk register. So I just wonder if some of these are departmental and, and not corporate. Perhaps, David, you could take that away and, and have, have another think with the exec team. Did you have a specific concern that someone would deem to be directorate as opposed to corporate? Well, 
normally a corporate risk register would end up between 10 and 15 major strategic risks. So I think what we're putting on here is issues rather than the impact on the organisation. So some of them perhaps could be um, the two are very similar, aren't they, in terms of what needs to be done in terms of the medical. So perhaps have a have a think about it with the exec team in terms of refreshing. Um, if, if, if the answer comes back that you know they're all um, genuine corporate risks, then then fine. Um, the second issue that I wanted to raise was the dates on the red risks. We um, whether there's any update or not. They've got May 2022 in them, and in some of them it says in the cover paper it says that there were meetings due at the end of June. So I guess it's what happened in those meetings and and should the date therefore reflect July um, or June, the audit committee in terms of um, the latest update because they're red. They're to, to answer that question, there is a timing issue with regards to the report. So they are they are they are correct at the time of publishing, but obviously they they are um, they are ready about two to three weeks beforehand. So there is there is a delay, uh, I'm afraid, and uh, that, that, that I'm afraid is, is going to be always the case. Uh, but I take on board your comments. Thank you. So nothing else for me. Okay, so we're asked to um, note the report, consider the progress. Um, I, I guess, sorry, um, on those red risks, um, I just want to be sure that we're, we're following them up suitably. And I've got the chair, obviously, of the Education <laughs> Commission and Quality Committee here. Those are we expecting on, right, I can't remember what, in the right. papers, whether there's something on those risks. Um, there will be an update. There will be an update on Friday. Okay. So I'm comfortable that those are, are, are being followed up. Okay. Um, and approve the recommendations um, on the wrong uh, item. Sorry, the committee is asked to note the contents of the risk register. Yes, the please. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, on to, we've done the okay, so on to 2.13 losses and special payments. Martin, are you taking this one? Oh, I was going to do this one, actually. Oh, sorry, I, I can't get it right. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, we we're trying to confuse. Um, so the losses and special payments um, report has been shared. The um, What is included in the report is all of the um, I suppose overpayment of salaries that, um, or for which we're still recovering um, money that is owed back to the organisation. So there were four overpayments of salaries between the 1st of April 21 and 31st of March 22. And, um, and just an update to the report. So we've now recovered £2,000 of the 4.2 that was overpaid. And there were two overpayments of salary in 21-22 and they have now been fully recovered so um, they will um, I suppose be fully resolved um, as at the next report. I was going to stop and ask if there were any questions. Thanks Triano. Uh, we haven't answered answer the questions though. Have they been recovered? <laughs> I'll make my usual comment as you might expect which is that you know two months we still had two overpayments of salaries and it's still slightly bothering me that the systems uh, are such that we're still getting overpayments and that's not our end I assume is this about reliance on others or is it something at our end I'll come in there um I, th I think the, the last two were, were errors within when payroll but it is a, I did a, a review and the combination of of late termination forms tends to be an issue, but that's a timing issue, I think, with, with the early cutoff of payroll. Um, but there are a number of issues uh, in, in the payroll team, which we are reviewing as part of our, our um, link with shared services. Okay, 
so I, I have done a, a bit of work just to review those because uh, you did raise on previous meetings and and we are we are working through those it might be something that we can pick up when we look at reliance on others again yeah. same thing absolutely same thing. okay lovely all right um so anything for information no i don't think so there's no hands up um has anybody got any other business no okay lovely thank you um so the date of the next meeting is monday the 17th of october um at 10 a.m um in the conference room here and by zoom so thank you very much everybody today for attendance um i'm going to what time is it 12 10 is five minutes dinner for people and come back at um quarter past for the closed meeting Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Bye.